uh, <coughs> acne scars. Uh, زي ما يعني دايما بقول احنا دايما قبل ما نفكر الليزر ده يشتغل ولا لا we have to think of the pathology. What is the pathogenesis we are dealing with? A common mistake we are doing and احنا we think that laser is a magical tool. Uh, whatever we have is a magical tool. Without understanding what is the pathology we are dealing with, we will lose the way. فدايما احنا ده اللي بيميزنا كدرماتولوجيست عن البيوتيشنز والتكنيشنز والناس اللي مش من السبيشاليتي بتاعتنا اللي بيروحوا يشتغلوا بالليزر ان احنا المفروض ان احنا فاهمين what is the pathology and the pathogenesis we are dealing with and then we have to evaluate the tools the different tools we have عشان نستخدم الطول المناسب في المكان المناسب with the right expectations as with any other skin problem we have to remember when we are dealing with the acne scar and is the skin is formed of the epidermis, the dermis and the subcutaneous tissue. And we always have to ask ourselves, where is the pathology? In which layer is it there? In acne scars, where is the pathology? pathology layer the skin. What do you think? In the dermis, we all think that the problem is linked to the dermis, which is true. طيب, السؤال التاني. In the best hands, and I out of ill percentage of improvement, we can achieve in treating acne scars. What do you think? And eyes are calm. 60-70%? Mini Zawud? 40%? So 60-70% is the maximum improvement we can achieve in treating acne scars. But I think if we take a, a, a different approach, we can increase that incident to 80 or 90%. What is that approach? The epidermis is composed of conocytes and living cells. And this is the normal healthy composition of the epidermis. 35% conocytes, 65% living cells. With photoaging, which we are all exposed to, this ratio is going to be inversed. So will get hyperkeratosis. The conocytes will increase from 35% up to 60% on the expense of living cells, which are going to diminish to 40%. And this is a patient who is coming to tell you, I have dull looking skin. And also, those patients are going to tell you whatever I use topically, it doesn't work. And it's going to be consumed with thick layer of corneocytes, which is not going to be affected with it. So the efficacy of the topically applied agent will be less. More importantly, those patients are having defective barrier function. With defective barrier function, those patients are having more incidence of allergies, sensitive skin, infections, but also we have more transepidermal water loss. And those are patients who are coming to complain of skin dryness. And dry skin is losing elasticity. This is a baby who is having gastroenteritis and vomiting and diarrhea. And we teach the parents, we tell them every day, you have to do pinching the abdominal skin. If it does not retract, this is a sign of dehydration. Rush to the hospital. The baby needs fluids. On a smaller scale, we sometimes ask the patients to do this pinch test to see how soon it is going to retract. If it is slow, this is a sign of dehydration. Type. On a smaller scale, let me call epidermis and there is transepidermal water loss. This patient is coming to tell you my skin is rough, it is not smooth anymore. But fine lines. This is coming from the fact that the skin lost the elasticity when it loses the hydration. يبقى معنى كده ان انا وان كان عندي مشكله في الاكني سكارز في الديرمس بس if the epidermis is impaired whatever i do to stimulate the collagen and improve the quality of the dermis the epidermis is not looking healthy because it is losing the elasticity it is rough فيبقى في الحاله دي احنا محتاجين to do something at the level of the epidermis in order to deal with the hyperkeratosis and while we do that, this is going to stimulate the living cells to proliferate. And in this case, we are able to uh, improve the quality of the epidermis, which is going to be reflected on how the skin is looking. 
لما اول ما بنعمل كده اول ما نقدر نوصل للنتيجه دي بنلاقي ان السكين از لوكينج ماتش يونجر ماتش هيلثير جاست باي وركينج اون ذا ابيديرمس ات ذيس ستيج كمان ويل سي ذات اني ثينج وي ابلاي توبيكالي از جوينج تو بي ابزورب ماتش بيتر فالافيكاسي اوف وات ايفر وي ابلاي توبيكالي از جوينج تو بي ماتش بيتر اند فاينلي ذير ويل بي ريستوريشن اوف ذا ابيديرمال بارير فانكشن ويتش از جوينج تو امبروف ذا هايدريشن اوف ذا سكين اند ذيس از اجين جوينج تو ريفلكت اون ذا poor size on the smoothness and if there is fine lines and wrinkles it might go away just by improving the hydration of the skin in many cases we have patients who are complaining of problems beyond the surface but if we didn't pay attention that the surface is impaired the result and the improvement is not going to be optimum and because of that dealing with the epidermis and restoring the epidermal barrier function is a vital step in any rejuvenation plan whatever the problem is because this is something which we all need yani in a patient like this acne scars if we didn't improve the epidermis whatever we do to the dermis stimulating the collagen is not going to get us more than 60 maybe 70% But if you combine the treatment with epidermis, if we improve the epidermis only in this patient, 20% improvement will occur to the acne scars without touching the dermis. So this is something which is really uh, uh, underestimated in many cases. The dermis, we have the collagen, and the collagen is going to be impaired in cases of acne scars, but also we have the underlying deeper soft tissue. And this is undergoing certain changes, which is going to lead to skin laxity, And if there is skin laxity, then we need to tighten the skin. Again, if a patient who is having acne scars is having a degree of skin laxity and we tightened the skin, the acne scar will improve another 20, 30% just by tightening the skin and improving uh, the tone of the skin. So this is something, again, we have to remember. So our objective in order to treat acne scars or any skin problem is to work on the epidermis and change this structure of the epidermis into that one by doing a keratolytic treatment. This can be topicals, retinoids, it can be chemical peel, it can be microdermabrasion, it can be laser peel. So choose whatever tool you have available, but we have to work on the epidermis. And then at the level of the dermis, we need to do something to stimulate the collagen and uh, induce neocollagenesis. And this can be so many things. It can be fractional lasers, it can be needling, it can be non-ablative rejuvenation. We have to pick a tool in order to work on the dermis to stimulate the collagen. And finally, if there is skin laxity, we need to tighten the skin using uh, radio frequency or long pulse NDAG or whatever you want, but we need to tighten the skin if there is a degree of skin laxity. This is the principle. I'm going to show you some tools I have used during the past years in order to deal with that problem. So I'm using the non-ablative NDAG for remodeling, where we are targeting the hemoglobin uh, and also the water in order to induce neocollagenesis. And for this, in order to target both the hemoglobin and the water, the 1064 NDAG is the ideal wavelength because it's the only wavelength which can target both. So those are the parameters we have used, 1064. We use six millimeter spot with 14 or 15 joules or nine millimeter with 10. We have to use short pulse duration, 0.3 to 0.6, because in order to target the microvessels, we have to uh, have a pulse duration less than one millisecond. The uh, Ustazel is talking on the phone from the first lecture. It is really not important to talk on the phone here. Thank uh, you We use five to 10 hertz. So we have to be very fast and we have to be in dynamic motion all the time. And there are four nodes here. We don't use cooling. And the objective of the treatment here is to increase the temperature to 43 degrees and to maintain that for three minutes. This is how we get results. We don't apply anesthesia and this is very important because we need the feedback of the patient. If a certain area was heated up too much, then this is going to lead to collagen denaturation, which we don't want. So I want the patient to scream or to push me back if the heat goes up too much. No contact, we are about two centimeter above the surface of the skin so that we are able to homogeneously diffuse the pulses. And finally, there is no topical steroids. And from my point of view, any procedure with the aim of stimulating the collagen 
We shouldn't apply topical steroids because we stimulate the collagen by inducing an inflammatory response, which is going to invite fibroblasts. Fibroblasts will synthesize new collagen. Anti-inflammatory medications, including steroids, will stop and suppress the inflammatory process, and then it is not going to be very effective. So those are precautions. Monitoring the temperature, again, is a key in order to get the result. We published our experience in the laser and surgery and medicine in 2011, where we combined this non-ablative NDAC treatment with the microderm abrasion. We were doing four sessions of microderm abrasion, four to six sessions, one week interval, and three sessions of laser in one month interval. And this was published in this uh, journal, and the photos were on the cover page. So for those patients, as I said, we applied three sessions of laser and four to six sessions of microderm abrasion, and we can see how much the texture of the skin improved. It's not only the acne scars, but look at the wrinkles, look at the texture of the skin. This is due to the collagen induction. So now we combined microderm abrasion for the epidermis and laser to stimulate the collagen. And again, this is one of the photos which were on the cover page, and we can see multiple pathology, active acne, acne scars, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and large pores, and we can see how much improvement of the texture of the skin. The beauty about this combination is that there is no downtime. So it's erythema for 15, 20 minutes, and that's it. It doesn't improve. Another technique which I really like is the dermaroil, the microneedling where we have a disposable tool which is having needles. It goes through the skin and it stimulates the collagen synthesis. There are very nice uh, publications about that. One of them is a Nature magazine, which is talking about the electrodynamics and how much the needles are able to increase the negative electrical potential, which is linked to the stimulation of the uh, regeneration of the tissue. And now we have the motorized rollers, the derma pen and the micro pen, and those which are associated with more fast uh, procedure and less pain. And the advantage of this is the lack of uh, hyperpigmentation. Uh, when we are not using heat, then there is no hyperpigmentation. So this is something which we have seen in Asian skin, which is very much prone for hyperpigmentation. Uh, we don't have the risk of hyperpigmentation. When the patient is young and there is no skin laxity, we don't need the heat. So in this case, the microneedling will would do a great job, and we can see that it can be used for dark skin without any problem. And then uh, next step was using the microneedling radio frequency, where the device is going to have the needles going into the skin according to the size or the length we determine, and then it will emit radio frequency at the same time. So we are combining needling with fractional radio frequency. It works very nicely. There were very nice studies about it. One of them was studying the genes involved in dermal remodeling, and they studied the fibrillin, the tropoelastin, pro-collagen 1, and pro-collagen 3, and there was significant jump uh, after four weeks, after, in 28 days in those very important mediators, and this proves that this is not a temporary improvement. It is going to be a long-term and it can improve the skin quality in a very nice fashion. Of course, now this technology is going to target the dermis. We have to combine something which is going to improve also the epidermis, but with the right combination, we can improve the quality of the skin in a very nice way, even in dark skin, and we can see that this is, again, uh, uh, not associated with downtime. There was a comparative study between the fractional carbon dioxide and the micro radio frequency, split face, where they treated half of the face with micro radio frequency and the other half with carbon dioxide, fractional carbon dioxide, and they found that clinically they were equ equivalent, so both of them led to significantly decreased uh, acne and acne scars, but the downtime which was much shorter with the micro radio frequency versus the CO2. So the patients were uh, asked to do a second session, but they refused. They said micro radio frequency is okay, but not the CO2, so they had only one session in this study. And this was an article which I published in 2013, I think, about the use of fractional radio frequency uh, in acne and acne scars. One of the things which we have to keep in mind, again, as dermatologists, if we are treating rolling scars, those rolling scars are having fibrous bands, which is dragging the skin downwards. So those patients will come back with worsening of the acne scar. They will tell you, now my acne scar is worse than before the treatment. Why? Because those fibrous bands are dragging the skin downwards. When we do something to stimulate the collagen, then the skin is becoming thicker, 
so the shoulders will go up. So the base is going to be deeper. And that's why it's very important in those cases to combine the treatment with subcision in the same session. And subcision has been done with knocker needle. Sometimes if we don't have knocker needle, we use the syringe, the 5cc or the 10cc syringe uh, needle, uh, 25, and it works very nicely. But recently I started to use this very nice instrument, corneal scalpel. Ophthalmologists are using uh, this scalpel in order to work on the cornea, but it has uh, very sharp edges, very nice, and it is very easy to do the subcision with this instrument and uh, with, with much less trauma to the skin. So this is something I started to use and I think it is much less traumatic than the knocker needle. And in this case, we can really improve the skin. So we are doing the subcision, we are doing whatever to do to stimulate the collagen, and we have to work on the epidermis. Now, a very important question, when we are doing needling versus the non-ablative laser, then uh, we are treating fractions of the skin with the needling or the fractional laser. We are covering only 20, 30% of the surface of the skin. Whereas if you are doing the non-ablative and the egg, then I'm covering 100% of the skin. So when to do that and when to do that, it will depend actually on the pathology. A patient like that, where the pathology is covering more than 30% of the surface of the skin, I need something to cover most of the surface. So for this patient, I would use the non-ablative ND egg or the resurfacing or whatever to cover 100% of the surface of the skin. If we have a localized problem like this or like that, then we can do the microneedling or even the fractional laser because the problem is localized to a small area of the skin. Of course, we have to discuss with the patient what they are willing to get. If I do resurfacing for this patient, definitely the improvement is going to be magnificent. However, is the patient willing to stay at home for 10 days? So sometimes the downtime has to be discussed with the patient, and the patient might choose a less effective tool like non-ablative rejuvenation, which requires many sessions, but they don't want the downtime. So we have different tools and we have to discuss with them. But from my point of view, it is really very important, number one, to determine would the fractional laser or the microneedling work or we need something which will cover the full surface of the skin because the pathology is more extensive. So this is something which we'll uh, decide according to the situation. The other thing, do we need to add tightening or no tightening is required? If the patient is having some laxity in the skin like this patient, definitely doing something to tighten the skin will improve the acne scars. Whereas if the patient is young and the skin is really having very good tone and it's not uh, uh, lax, then there is no point of uh, doing tightening. We don't want to waste resources and money of the patient and so on. So this is something we have to evaluate. Where is the pathology? What are the tools we have? And then we draw the treatment uh, plan according to what we need. This is a short video, which I think it has a message behind. So the same with acne scars. We shouldn't think that the problem is only in the derms. We have to think of the skin as different layers and we have to analyze the different layers and draw the treatment plan accordingly. Uh, uh, a couple of things which I need to, uh, to announce, the ESLED, uh, the European Society of Laser and Energy-Based Devices, I strongly encourage you to join. Uh, we have a lot of educational activities which uh, I think it's very beneficial. We have the newsletter which is coming almost every month and there is a journal which is being sent to uh, the members and we'll have a laser course, teaching course in Geneva on 7th and 8th of July. This is the next course which I uh, think whoever attended 
found it very useful over two days where there is theoretical sessions and practical sessions, and I would be very happy to see some of you attending that. Uh, there will be, for 10 minutes more, some uh, practical uh, cases for laser safety, which I would like to go through quickly. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through that very quickly in the coming uh, 10 or less minutes. Uh, when we talk about laser safety and laser complications, we have to differentiate between professional errors and adverse effects. Adverse effects will happen in the best hands. With all the precautions we'll take, it will happen. Uh, so patients has to know that there's an incidence of complications, even if everything went well, it might happen. However, professional errors are problems which we can fix and we can minimize it to 0% with proper training, with proper technique, with proper selection of parameters, and so on. So this is a very important thing. This is hypopigmentation, which occurred after laser-assist hair removal. Would you consider this professional error or complication? What do you think? Professional error, yes. Why? Why it's professional error? If we see the pattern of the laser applied, this is something, someone who is using the laser for the first time. So it is lack of training and also lack of selecting the right parameters. So it's too high fluence, too short pulse duration, and we can see from the pattern. This is someone who has just started the training. Uh, this is a patient who was treated with Alexandrite laser, and the patient was tanned, and the wrong parameters were used. And again, we can see a very bad pattern of uh, uh, coverage of the skin, and we can see the hyperpigmentation which occurred. For this patient, there are two questions here. Is this transient hyperpigmentation or scabbing? Transient hyperpigmentation. Uh, actually, in order to answer that question, we have to know the answer. Hyperpigmentation will occur only after three weeks. Anything before that, it is not hyperpigmentation. So it is scabbing. And one of the things which is very important, this was an IPL system, and the IPL is having contact cooling. When we are working on curved surface, the contact is not going to be covering the whole surface. So it will protect the area which is in contact, and the other area which is not in contact is going to be exposed to the IPL without any protection. So we'll get such uh, effect and problem and complication. Mm -hmm. So the full contact with contact handpiece is very important and vital in order to avoid those complications. This is a patient who was treated for three or four times for hair removal and she came up for retouch. But during the session, she was complaining that the pain was much more than previous sessions. And the technician was using the same parameters used before, but she went on. And once the patient went home, she sent her photos, and then we started to see what's going on, and this was the problem. So the optics of the laser was damaged. And when we have such a problem in the, uh, in the lens or in the filter, then the laser is going to be overshooting. There will be hot, hot spots. So it's really very important every now and then to uh, inspect the lenses and the optics of the laser, because if there is damage, will damage the skin. We might damage the skin. So this is something we have to do frequently. Uh, it induces initially hypopigmentation. It's going to repigment. Uh, but if we can avoid that, it is much better. In this patient, we have two problems. This patient came for hair removal in the upper uh, lip. And we have two problems. One, we can see very poor overlap. So this is a pulse of laser. This is a pulse, and this is a pulse. And in between, there was no treatment. So the proper overlap is very important. Otherwise, we'll have the honeycomb appearance, and the patient will have the impression that who worked was not professional enough. The other thing is this mole or nevus. It was removed. So yes, it has pigment. It's going to absorb the laser, which is targeting melanin. So it can go away. So it's very important to discuss with the patient. Do you like the, your nevus? Because sometimes they like it very much, and they will kill you if you remove it. So it's really something we have to discuss. If you want to avoid it, we have to avoid firing the laser over, and we have to cover it with a white marker or with a corrector or something which is going to avoid 
uh, having an impact on it. This is a patient who was treated uh, with hair removal and she came after the sessions, very nice result, but she said, I developed white hair after the laser hair removal. Luckily, we had the photo of before and when we look carefully, we'll see that the white hair was there, but it was masked with black hair. Once we get rid of the black hair, the white hair, which does not, is not being affected with laser, is going to be more prominent. So in this case, we have to tell the patient from the beginning that you have white hair. It is not going to respond to the laser. And the only solution for that is electrolysis. It's going to be more prominent afterwards. So this is something we have to let the patient know. And we have to take uh, to have the photographs. This is another patient who came and she said, I developed hyperpigmentation after the laser. So luckily, we had the photos of before, and we showed her that she had even more hyperpigmentation because of the repeated plucking, and it, is, it has improved. Still, it's going to, to be there for some time, but it will improve. So documentation is very important. Patients tend to forget. So having the photos of before is crucial in order to be able to defeat, uh, to defend ourselves whenever is required. This is a patient with skin type 5 who is having pseudofolliculitis barbie. So this is the diagnosis. When to treat? If a patient like that is coming with inflamed skin, should we use the laser or it's better to postpone till the inflammation subsides? Usually we don't like to treat inflamed or irritated skin with laser. So it's much better to wait till the inflammation subsides. There are two ways in order to do that. Either to ask the patient to shave every day so the process stops and the inflammation will subside they will think we are crazy, but actually the cause of the inflammation is that the curly hair goes back to the skin and induce foreign body reaction. So once we shave every day, the hair will not grow to irritate the skin. Or leave the beard for 10 days, the inflammation will subside, shave and come next day. So the skin is going to be free of any inflammation and at that time we can treat the patient. What parameters? Wavelength, skin type five, very thick, coarse hair. What are the options we have? Can we use Alexandrite? Can we use IPL? It's only diode or NDA. And NDA is safer even than diode. For the fluence, as long as we are working on very thick hair, low fluence will do the job. 20 joule will be enough. Very tolerable pain, very effective, no complications, no problem. The pulse duration has to be long, 40 or even 50 milliseconds, as long as the hair is thick. And then when the hair becomes thinner, then we start to increase the fluence and decrease <clears throat> the pulse duration, spot size shouldn't be large. I don't use 15 millimeter spot here, it's going to be very painful. I would use 10 millimeter spot, which is going to be very much tolerable by the patient and it's going to be still effective. It's small area, so there's no point with the, uh, there's no problem with the pain. If we try to use NDX to treat port wine stain, which is superficial vascular lesion, we have to use very short pulse duration, we have to use high fluence, and in this case, we have potential risk of scarring. So for superficial vascular lesions, it's either IPL or pulse dye laser. We shouldn't use the NDAG for such uh, superficial uh, lesions. Purpura will happen in 100% of cases of port wine stain treated with pulse dye laser. If the patient was not informed that this is going to happen, he will think that his skin was burned. So sometimes educating the patient and letting them know what to expect is going to alleviate a lot of stress and is going to improve the outcome because the patient will not complain and this is something we have to expect. Dioscopy is something we sometimes do in order to enhance the outcome of the lasers. In tattoo removal and in some pigmented lesion, we can compress the skin with a glass slide and also in some small uh, uh, hemangiomas in order to improve the optical delivery of the laser and alleviate the other chromophores and this can improve the outcome and you fire the laser over the glass slide and this can improve the response of the treatment and also uh, the skin. Photography is very important. This is a patient who came and he, she said, I didn't improve after four sessions of rejuvenation and tightening, but when we showed her the photos of before, I think she was very impressed and she was very happy with the outcome. So I'll skip that. I would like just to invite you to join the IMCAS Alert. It is a website uh, on the IMCAS Academy where uh, I'm the coordinator, where we can post different complications which we can 
face and then we'll get expert opinion in about 24 hours or less. Uh, we had many uh, cases of complications and a lot of opinions. So it's a very nice platform in order to share any complications we might have. And I think it is a very useful tool, which I strongly encourage you to try to use uh, on the IMCAS Academy platform. And um, this was one of the very interesting cases where we developed bruises after treating veins under the eye three weeks after. So this is something which can happen, a lot of discussion where we can learn a lot. Thank you very much for your attention.